Hi, my name's Phil, I like talking about politics and in this video I'd like to discuss some of the issues emerging from Sunak's protocol deal, the Windsor Framework, ahead of the vote in Parliament next Wednesday. The vote will pass, of course it will, but might Sunak face an uncomfortable time with some of the questions being asked as a result of leaving it as long as he has? But first, if you'd like to be notified of daily news and politics, please subscribe to the channel and click the bell notification icon. So when Sunak announced his Windsor framework and got agreement from like his party, essentially most of his party, including many MPs in the ERG, looked like a stunning coup. He said there would be a vote in Parliament. It's not really a concession because Tory rebels would force one if he hadn't offered one. Sunak also said that he would give MPs time to read it all properly before holding that vote. Which is a good joke. MPs rarely read anything that they're voting for. But I expected him to wait a, wait a week or so and then hold the vote. Get it out of the way. Move on. The vote will now happen next Wednesday. This will be over three weeks after his announcement. Now, the framework doesn't need a parliamentary vote because it's, it's not primary legislation. The vote is only taking place at all as a courtesy and ultimately because MPs would force the vote if the government didn't grant one anyway. But I think Sunak, I think he should have held the vote sooner. As more time has passed, all it's done is give more time for problems to emerge. So Geoffrey Donaldson this week, leader of the DUP, has sort of come out and said the deal's you know, on the right lines but needs, he said, further clarification, reworking and change. Not really sure in this context what the difference between reworking and change is, but there you are. Now, this isn't the DUP saying it rejects the deal, by the way. Uh, their, their formal debate is still ongoing. But this intervention from Donaldson, who is seen as someone who wants Stormont back up and running, I gather, uh, makes it look like there are problems placating the hardliners in his party. Otherwise, why interject? Because he knows there's not going to be any reworking of it. You know, the clarification's fine. Asking for more clarification, absolutely. And in actual fact, it's perfectly reasonable, given that there seems to be a few discrepancies arriving in like the, uh, the sort of English versions of these. Because, but Donaldson specifically said things like, you know, it, it, the all trade friction between Britain and Northern Ireland must disappear. Well, it's not going to. The cause of that is Britain leaving the customs union single market. Nothing to be done about it. The protocol is, is not just the best way of dealing with it. It's the only way anyone ever came up with. The only solutions that Brexiteers ever came up with themselves, you know, the sort of more swivel-eyed loon Brexiteers, was uh, one, hard border inside Ireland, obviously a non-starter, and two, for Ireland to leave the EU and rejoin the UK. Can't believe I also have to point out that's a non-starter, but that is where we are these days. The cretinous ramblings of Dave, the village idiot down the pub, have to be discussed more widely because people like that are now in Parliament. Apologies to any Daves out there, most of you are not actually village idiots. But the DUP's acceptance was not necessarily factored into Sonak's plans. If it were, he would surely not have announced the deal before he had their agreement. His main focus is support within his own party. With Biden's attendance for the celebrations of 25 years of the Good Friday Agreement also on his mind, that's only a few weeks away. I think the latest is that he will be coming to Northern Ireland. So Sonak has a decent chance of getting his photo opportunity. But the DUP aside, there are more reasoned issues arising now as well. It has already been pointed out. There seems to be a few little discrepancies uh, between the Windsor Framework explanations on the UK government website and that of the EU. Now, you always get a little difference in emphasis between two sides. Obviously, any negotiation is um, both sides sort of need to sell it as a win. Really? Sometimes, you know, it is, it can be as well. But there'll always be a difference in emphasis on the both sides. But the agreement should be the same. Agreements need careful wording so that each side has the same understanding to what it's signing up to. The legal text obviously will be the same. But why are the explanations differently? Different, rather. You know, also, more seriously, so errors have been spotted in the UK's command paper. Now, a command paper is the document you give MPs. You, you can try giving them the legal text if you like, but very few people are in Parliament are qualified to read a legal text. There are, there are a reasonable number of lawyers, I suppose higher than the uh, average for the population in Parliament. Most MPs are not lawyers. 
So you give them a document that's written in plain English. This is a command paper. It tells them what they need to know about, in this case, a treaty. You know, no one expects an MP to understand legal text that they're voting for or against. Um, you know, so that's all there is to it. You know, you give these command papers out so the more literate members of parliament can cope with them more easily. Obviously, most MPs don't even read those. Too much effort. So they rely on their tribal leader to tell them what to think. If Sunak is lucky, they'll consider him to be their tribal leader. If there are errors being discovered in that, in other words, differences between what the command paper says and what the legal text says, it's not just a, a, a difference of emphasis, but it's actually, no, it doesn't say that in the legal text at all, then those who want to derail the agreement can claim that Sunak only gets the support of his MPs by feeding them false information, by making claims about what it will do which aren't quite true. What we're getting now is experts, now that you know, they've had time to go through the agreement, is, you know, the, the, on balance, they're still saying it's a good agreement. You know, it is good that we have this cooperative approach between the Tories and the EU now. And sure enough, it takes off some, some of the rough edges from the original protocol agreement. But there are still questions about exactly how the agreement impacts on trade at a practical level on the ground. It's not clear in all cases exactly what is required. So that means there's going to be further discussions required. And in the days following the agreement announcement, the government did say it'll take up to two years to implement. No kidding if we're still not entirely sure exactly what the agreement means in enough detail to apply it. The same people who want to derail the Brexit argument that they supported are also frothing about the announcement of the EU Parliament that they've signed into law powers which allow the Commission to impose trade sanctions on the UK if we breach our Brexit deals with them. In actual fact, this was agreed by Boris Johnson David Frost back in 2020. It's just that the EU have now passed into law the mechanism whereby they can apply the powers that the Tories agreed to over two years ago. But it's a reminder that if the UK government breaches either the withdrawal agreement, which includes the protocol, or the trade and cooperation agreement, there's not going to be a tortured process going on in the EU to determine their response. The Tories won't be able to breach the agreement for, you know, to get Daily Mail readers on side. Safe in the knowledge it'll take the EU months to work out what to do about it. And as long as they then restore the agreement before they do, when something, whatever it is, whatever distraction they need is no longer needed, then it'll all be fine. That's not going to be the case. The Commission can now take immediate action. So Sunak needs the protocol to work via his Windsor framework. He can't afford trade sanctions when the economy is going to be the main issue for voters at the next election, as it always is, and it's already very fragile. And yet, by leaving it in limbo for so long, I just thought he was potentially risking problems when the vote did come along. You know, I'm sort of assuming Sunak's basically got it under control, and the vast majority of his MPs just want it done and dusted. You know, for many Tory MPs, it was always just a handy distraction to continue their fight with the EU at a time when they didn't want people asking about <laughs> the Brexit trade barriers between Britain and the EU. So it's like, no, focus on these non-problems we've got between Britain and Northern Ireland, where it's much lower trade friction. You know, now, after you know, if you're going to say... Because what they were trying to do is hide the fact that before we left the EU, everything was the EU's fault and the solution was to leave it. That's well, now we've left it. Shouldn't it be your responsibility? I mean, if you're going to say the way to stop the EU ruining our lives is to leave the EU, you can hardly continue to blame the EU after leaving, although they gave it a bloody good go. But maybe they've now decided that the arguments over the protocol have served their purpose. No good will come of a humiliating trade war. Because the thing about kicking the can down the road is you eventually run out of road. The Northern Ireland Protocol Bill signified the end of that road. So something had to be done quite soon. But Sunak has to win this vote. And he has to win the vote with over half the votes cast being Tory MPs. It's no good winning the vote in itself. The vote itself is meaningless, legally. You know, he's easily going to win the vote because the opposition will support it. You know, he doesn't need the votes to implement the deal at all. You know, it's there as effectively a confidence vote in him. That's what it is. But a prime minister who only gets controversial votes won in parliament with opposition votes risks open rebellion. The government have made it clear that the vote next Wednesday will be the vote on the deal. 
should be obvious enough, but it sounds like Sunak wants to make it clear to his MPs, you don't use the vote next Wednesday as some safe protest vote, it is the vote on the deal. In addition, for all my criticism of Sunak taking longer than I would have wanted in arranging this vote, I'd have done it after a week, there will be some who will have wanted it to take place much later. You know, there, there will be some in the Tory party who will have tried to urge Sunak to wait until the DUP have announced their verdict. So perhaps I should give Sunak some credit for not waiting even longer. In fact, come to think of it, even the ERG, much more important to him than the DUP, they've not announced their formal conclusion either. I suspect because there's a bit of an argument going on there. If they haven't announced their conclusions by next Wednesday, then they'll be moot. Parliament will have had it say, be done, finished. Forget it, it's in the rearview mirror. Rejecting the deal afterwards will just look foolish. But there would surely have been some pressure for Sunak to wait until at least the ERG, if not the ERG and the DUP, had made their formal assessment of the agreement known. The fact he hasn't suggests a couple of things. First, he's not so confident about getting the Tory votes needed that he's happy to wait indefinitely. In theory, you know, he could have started implementing this anyway, he doesn't need the vote. He could have waited another few weeks for the vote. If he was confident, it would still pass easily. You know, I think, you know, if there's a risk that the detractors in the ERG might persuade some of their more supportive colleagues to reverse their position, could be dodgy. Second, that the opposition, even in the ERG, is so weak that he doesn't need to care about dismissing the importance of their formal appraisal and can proceed with the vote without it. Now, it might be that only one of those two things is true. I tend to feel both probably are. He had overwhelming support for the agreement. He had members of the ERG... Um, announcing their support for it and you know when he announced it it's not possible to build on that support only to see it drain away and the longer he left it the more it drains away so this vote really can't come soon enough for him unless something trips him up you would think it should be done and dusted next week actually next week this is not a convenient day again is it next wednesday should be a bit of a, an interesting day but it could also be a very bad day for boris johnson See, he's got to face questions from the Privileges Committee on that day. And then, later on, he'll be exposing his own lack of parliamentary support. Basically, almost non-existent parliamentary support. See, Johnson has, very foolishly, I think, formally come out against the agreement. He said that he is against the, the Windsor Agreement. The Windsor Framework, sorry. Now, if he had any pull within the parliamentary party... That would mean that Sunak will not have the Tory votes needed because Johnson basically signalled, I expect a rebellion on this. But everyone thinks that Sunak does have the support he needs, thus publicly demonstrating that while Johnson may still be popular in the Tory media and perhaps even amongst party members, he does not have very much, if any, political capital left in Parliament. But there we are. Those are my thoughts. Let me know yours in the comments below. I hope you found the video interesting. If you did, please click the like button if you'd like to support the channel further. The join button for memberships. And until next time, I'll see you later.